I just thought I'd start this series by introducing myself. Um, my name is Lauren Heffernan. I am the owner of Isla Grace and the co-creator of the Baby Led Sleep Approach. Um, I am a three times certified pediatric sleep specialist as well as almost or about to write my exam to become an IBCLC, which is an international board certified lactation consultant. Um, I have been supporting families with sleep for about seven years now and have helped well over 2000 families to get more sleep without using any sleep training. Um, my approach is geared at parents who are looking for an alternative to sleep training, who choose not to sleep train. Um, and so you'll notice in a lot of my um, answers to you, I do talk a lot about normal infant sleep, understanding attachment and development um, as I'm giving you answers. Some of the things you'll hear are not uh, exactly the traditional type of answers when it comes time to sleep. I would like to remind you that a lot of the sleep advice that we have been given, a lot of the rules that we're following, a lot of the um, the things that are out there on baby sleep are actually quite dated. So a lot of the information we're getting is actually coming from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, and specifically around studies that were done on solitary sleeping formula feeding babies. Um, and also just a lot of it uh, was, was also created by a number of uh, physicians who actually never took care of their own children. So um, it is important to make sure that you're, whenever you're hearing sleep information, that you are filtering through uh, what's more current, what we know now about infant sleep. And so my goal in this little Q&A is to give you a little insight into what we know um, about baby sleep. I was also going to say, if I'm answering questions, I just want you to know that I don't know your baby. Um, I don't know your family. I really do, when I work with families, see every family and baby as unique. Um, and so it is really important to know that um, there are some questions I couldn't answer because I don't know the age of your baby. Um, I don't know anything about your family, um, but also just a reminder that this advice is not meant to replace any medical advice. So please, please, if you are concerned about feeding or sleeping, um, please make sure that you are reaching out to your pediatrician or if it's feeding related that you're reaching out to an IBCLC. So I'll get started in answering some of these questions. All right. So someone asked about newborn sleep tips. So I'm gonna give you a few. Number one, I always say that the most important thing to know with newborn sleep is to expect lots of night wakings and lots of unpredictability. So it is really important that newborns wake at night. Um, you will have some babies who sleep longer stretches, but a lot of babies will wake frequently. The other thing is they really don't know the difference between day and night. Um, so you might notice that they sleep longer stretches during the day, and then they're having a party in the middle of the night. Uh, the other thing that's really important to know is that babies are actually born nine months premature and they do rely on the contact and closeness of their caregivers in order to complete their external gestation. So it is kind of, I know for a lot of parents, really frustrating when they feel like they can't put their baby down. You do need to remember that being on you and close to you and next to you is where they feel safest. It is the closest place to the womb, which they have spent their past several months in where it was safe and secure. And now they come out and being on you and next to you and close to you is where they do feel that safeness. They can hear your heartbeat. They can feel the warmth on your body. Um, and so that is why most babies will sleep so much better when they are in arms. The other thing that's important to know about babies is that they attach through the senses. So in the first year, um, if they cannot hear you or see you or smell you or feel you, they are going to feel often unsafe um, and a little bit more panicked. Um, so that is why oftentimes you will find that they will have the best sleep when they're on you, close to you, next to you, because falling asleep is actually quite a vulnerable process. So I also want, I did take notes because I wanted to make sure I said anything. Um, the other thing that is important to know about babies for newborn sleep is that they love motion. They love, again, those contact naps. Um, they love um, sleeping close. They love feeding to sleep. Um, they love being outside and falling asleep. All of these things are really typical. Um, I would say newborns, but in the first year. And they're normal and they're healthy and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I was gonna add to this piece as well is it's important at this point to find your own 
um, find what works best for your family. So I love when parents at the newborn stage are able to tune out all the noise, all the rules, all the books, and just tune into their baby, see them as unique, follow their baby, um, tune into their unique cues, uh, and really just ignore um, all the advice around baby sleep uh, and just do what works best for you and your family. So those are a couple newborn sleep tips or a couple important things to know. And really just do what works for you and your family and enjoy that time. I think when we let go of all the rules and all the expectations, we can really enjoy that first year as much as possible. Oh, and the last thing I wanted to say is make sure that you're calling on your village. If you have anyone in your community or your village um, who can help you and support you, bring them in as early on as possible and get them involved where they can be so that you still get to take moments to yourself um, and so that you have that help. Okay, so this next one, I wasn't sure whether I was gonna cover this, but let's do it. Uh, so someone asked, when should we start sleep training? So, uh, unpopular opinion, <laughs> you actually never have to sleep train if you don't want to. So I do think that we're led to believe that it's almost a rite of passage, that we all need to do it, or when we're exhausted and we're frustrated, that that's our only option. So my entire um, support is actually built on giving parents an alternative. I don't necessarily uh, ever recommend, I don't recommend sleep training, but I also don't believe in weighted out. So how um, I support families is with a bit of an in-between approach. Let me give you an example of something or a sleep challenge that one parent might find. Hey, I need to sleep train. So if you maybe are bouncing on a yoga ball for 45 minutes at bedtime or finding that you're needing to bounce your child back to sleep in the middle of the night um, and that you don't want to do that anymore. Number one, it is important to know that motion not only helps us fall asleep, but it also helps us um, stay in a deeper sleep. So motion works a lot of the time um, for babies and it will help them fall asleep faster. So anytime you're making changes around sleep um, and you're removing motion, it is important to remember that it might take longer and that's okay. Um, but what I might say to that family is, are you sure your baby's even tired? So sometimes we get caught up in following all these wake windows and books. Um, you know, we feel our baby needs to be asleep at the two hour mark and actually they're their own unique person and maybe it's two hours and 45 minutes for them. So one thing I will suggest to parents is starting uh, later and seeing, okay, hey, if you start 40 minutes later, do you only have five minutes of bouncing and is that okay or is it not okay? Uh, it is important to know that however you put your baby to sleep or back to sleep in the middle of the night is really no one else's business. And it's also not causing harm to your baby for you to parent your child to sleep so if you love it keep it um, and then if the parent says to me hey I'm doing five minutes of bouncing I still don't like it my back is hurting we might move from bouncing to rocking how do you feel about that now that you're in the rocking chair and you feel more supported um, in the chair how do you feel about that um, so again it is important to also know that babies' brains rely on patterns so anytime you shift a pattern your baby is going to react and tell you that they're frustrated because they're used to bouncing and now you're not bouncing now you're rocking or you've gone from rocking to holding or you've gone from holding to lying down beside your baby, whatever the transition that you've decided to make. And they're going to be upset and tell you, I'm frustrated, normally you bounce and you're not bouncing. And so when these types of situations come up, oftentimes parents will say, well, I need to sleep train then. Well, actually it's okay to shift patterns and be present with your baby. It's okay to say, normally I bounce, but we're not bouncing and I love you and I'm gonna snuggle you and I'm gonna kiss you and I'm gonna cuddle you and do all those great things. Um, you know, I always say, treat your baby in the same way that you treat any other person that you love who's having a hard time. Stay with them, be present with them, physically hold them, look at them, kiss them, love them um, through any of the changes that you're making. So instead of going to sleep training, we're saying, actually, I don't wanna bounce anymore. So I'm gonna set this limit because uh, it doesn't feel good and I'm going to support you as I shift and change the pattern and after a few nights your baby will get used to oh hey we're not bouncing anymore we're going to actually hold and I'm going to snuggle or I'm going to feed or I'm going to cuddle um, so these are some kind of ideas around um, making changes to sleep and these are things that really you can do around it's like from the beginning from day two we're not bouncing anymore we're not rocking anymore yes it's going to take some time yes your baby's probably going to be upset but if their tears are triggering you and every time you're supporting that emotion you're really struggling then again it's not a sleep challenge necessarily it is a fear of emotion and that's something that we can do the work on ourselves as parents and I'm sorry I'm trying to summarize this in one quick little snippet um, but yeah I have lots of ideas on my page 
So the first question that I was asked is, and I took notes over here so that I can remember my questions, is how to extend baby short naps during the day. So one really important thing to know about naps is the purpose of a nap is actually that we all, um, including young babies, build up something called homeostatic sleep pressure throughout the day. Um, and we take a nap or we use a nap in order to relieve that pressure that builds up throughout the day. So young children actually tend to not be able to stay awake um, as long as adults, obviously, um, throughout the day. So. Um, when that pressure builds, they will take a nap um, and then after that nap should wake up feeling somewhat refreshed and ready to go again. So when people talk about short naps, it is important to know that some babies will only ever nap between 20 to 30 minutes and this is just them and they wake up happy and they're ready to go and they're just fine. Um, every baby is different, just like all of us are different. Some babies will take a nap for an hour, some babies will take a nap for two hours, others will nap for 20 to 30 minutes. And they may continue doing this well into the first year. So there are some babies who just take those short naps and are fine. The key to knowing whether your baby's had enough sleep is to see how they feel when they wake up. So if they're waking up and they seem happy and, and well rested and ready to go, then that is enough sleep for them. Um, and so you may have one of those babies that just is a short napper and that just works fine. The other thing to know is that some babies will go through periods where if they're working on a new milestone or they're teething or they're uncomfortable, that they may take shorter naps. Um, and so this is pretty typical and sometimes it'll last about two weeks and then they'll get back to napping the way that they were before. Now, if your baby is waking up and seeming pretty unhappy, um, if they're really visibly upset, I would wonder if there's some sort of discomfort, but if not, and they're just waking up and they seem like they haven't had enough sleep, one of the best ways to get them back to sleep is use something that we know is amazing for helping us all fall asleep and stay asleep, which is motion. So if you can um, use some form of motion, the carrier is amazing, get them outside for a long walk, um, or you could even consider feeding them back to sleep, snuggling them back to sleep, um, and having them nap in arms, if that's something that's possible for you, just to get them a little bit of extra sleep. Okay, so I wanna cover this one without ruffling too many feathers. Uh, how do I teach my baby to self-soothe? So I'm gonna try to say as much as I can without, um, because this makes parents very upset uh, because it's something that we have all been told is that it's a skill that needs to be taught that our babies need to be able to learn to self-soothe. So the term itself was created by Dr. Tom Anders. Um, and he created the term because he was looking at babies um, in a nursery and observed that some babies, when they woke up, would lightly rouse and go back to sleep on their own and other babies would signal. So I like to tell parents that it's important to think about this term as almost a temperament type. So some babies wake and go back to sleep on their own. They are self-soothers. The babies who signal would be signalers. It wasn't, be, the self-soothers didn't self-soothe because they were taught to self-soothe. It's just who they were. It's just their temperament. Now, neither one is good or bad. So, you know, we kind of are led to believe that the signalers need to be trained to be a self-soother, but that is not the case because it is a temperament type. He never, ever, ever said that self-soothing could be trained or could be taught. The other thing to remember is that if we are doing the things that we typically do to get babies to self-soothe, which is um, leaving them to cry in hopes that they will learn to self-soothe, the actual crying and stopping um, for anyone, if we're really upset and we're crying and we're worked up and then we calm ourselves, that's actually self-regulation. Um, and so self-regulation doesn't happen well into childhood. Um, and it happens after years, lots of opportunities, lots of experiences of co-regulating with our caregivers. Um, and so people are going to say, but my baby self-soothed, I saw it. It just isn't self-soothing that you would see. So I, that's about as far as what I wanna go because it ruffles people's feathers, but I will say, it's not something that can be taught. It can be taught uh, self-soothing, it can be taught I guess emotional regulation can be taught 
over time in a sense, but it's more just the experience of co-regulating with a caregiver. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit with that question, but it's not a skill that can be taught. It is more just a temperament type. Um, either your baby does it and that's who they are or they don't. It's not good or bad. Okay, how do I combat, I think was the question, how do I combat my four month old sleep regression? Uh, you don't, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. It is a challenging time for a lot of parents and it's one of the times when a lot of parents will come to me looking for sleep, sleep support. Uh, it is important to reframe it. It's not a regression, it's a progression. It is a sign that your move, your baby is changing, is developing, is moving in the right direction. Um, so I think even just changing the way that we speak about it is a sleep progression. There's nothing regressing other than waking up more, um, but it is a progression, it's a step in the right direction. There is a lot going on at four months. Um, a few things to note is that your baby's sleep is becoming more adult-like and this is kind of like a permanent change to their sleep um, and so you'll start to notice that it might be more challenging to put them to sleep um, for them to stay asleep so this is the time when you want to use absolutely anything that you can and don't worry about creating bad habits it's survival mode you want to do whatever works for you and for your baby if it means motion to sleep feeding to sleep um, if it means sleeping closer to your baby this is a good this is something to keep in mind the other thing that's important to know is there's a lot going on as it relates to feeding so before the six to eight week mark your supply it was uh hormonally driven so it didn't really matter how many times your baby ent empties the breast you continue to produce milk uh, after that point it is supply and demand and so one thing that oftentimes i will see is that any impact any um feeding on a schedule not getting in if you're breastfeeding those six to eight breastfeeds ideally eight in 24 hours um whether you um whether there were any forced kind of longer stretches at night whatever that might be or if there's anything going on that's impacting tongue function so specifically tongue ties that have been undiagnosed and baby isn't draining the breast this will start to show up around three four months um, and supply can be impacted and oftentimes there will be this dip in supply if any of that has happened and it just so happens to show up around the four month mark and so parents think it is related to sleep but it's actually feeding so if you've noticed that your baby seems fussier at the breast if they're gassy if they're uncomfortable um, you know if you're struggling with feeding at all please, please book in to see an IBCLC um, and just have them do that assessment for you. Um, because again, it has nothing to do with sleep. So really just my tips are, is that it's survival mode, but if there's anything else going on as it relates to feeding, um, this won't kind of come and go. Um, and so it's worth reaching out to somebody who can support you with this and just do a proper assessment. I wanted to add a little piece um, about the four month progression that I forgot to add. But one really important thing to remember too is that oftentimes there's a lot of new milestones happening, happening at this time. And whenever we have, the majority of sleep progressions actually are related to new milestones or new learning. Whenever our little ones are learning new things, they wanna practice 24 seven. So their brain doesn't shut off because it's 6 p.m. So you might find that it's more challenging to put them to sleep and that they're up in the middle of the night so excited about their new skills and wanting to show you. So I always say to parents that making sure that your child is getting lots of daytime opportunities to move and move freely um, so that they can have lots of daytime practice. If your baby sleeps in a crib, it's also fun well for them <laughs> it's fun to do a lot of this practice in the crib during the day while you're there while you're watching you know so that you can be excited about all the new things that are going on uh, and that they can practice in the crib so that it's not uh, just nighttime when you're putting them in there and then they want to be practicing all these skills so it is a really good idea to make sure that when, whenever your baby's going through a progression that they have lots of opportunities during the day to practice uh, this doesn't mean that they're not going to practice at night but it will give them more opportunities to practice during the day um, so that they can master their new skills. Okay, so I thought this was a good one because it was asking about restlessness and baby being super restless. So um, I like to share a lot about what normal infant sleep looks like, which is the fact that it is normal for your baby to wake up a lot. 
at night um, and to need support to go back to sleep. It is normal for babies to want to be close uh, and even toddlers to sleep close. Um, it is normal to want to feed to sleep, to be rocked to sleep, to be held to sleep. Um, it is normal that they have sometimes a middle of the night party when they're going through a sleep progression. Um, it is normal actually for toddlers to be waking up at night, sometimes three, four times a night and sometimes needing uh, parent support to go back to sleep, sometimes taking about 20 minutes to go back to sleep. And there is actually a really uh, interesting study that we have that came out recently about sleep totals in 24 hours where they were looking at babies in the first year um, and shared that babies at three months might sleep somewhere between nine hours and 24 or 20 hours and 24. And on both ends of the spectrum, babies were completely fine. The only thing that that predicted is whether they would tend to be a lower sleep total or a higher sleep total baby as they got older. Um, so this stuff is all normal. So I suspect everything your baby is doing is normal. There are a few red flags when it comes time to sleep and some things to keep in mind. When you're talking about restlessness, um, sometimes it can be a sign of low iron. Um, so one of the things that I'll often say to parents is if you have ever been told that you ha had low iron in both pregnancy or if you had it postpartum, it is something to keep in mind if your baby is really restless. Um, and so this, I know in the US, oftentimes you guys test it a year. Um, so if that's the case, it's something just to speak to your child's pediatrician about. The other thing that's really, that it's a bit of a red flag is snoring and mouth breathing. Um, so when we sleep, our lips are meant to be sealed shut and our tongue is meant to be glued to the roof of our mouth. Snoring and mouth breathing are a sign that your baby's not breathing properly through their nose. And so it can be because of enlarged tonsils, enlarged adenoids. It can also be the result of an undiagnosed tongue tie. Um, so if your tongue is tethered down, uh, it's not sitting at the roof of your mouth, which isn't helping, which is uh, preventing your palate from forming nice and wide, which can lead to the palate coming up really high and up into the nasal cavity. And that can impact your ability to breathe properly through your nose. And so then we'll sometimes see babies who are breathing with their mouth open. So these are really just things to keep in mind, um, especially if your baby is really restless, if they're having a hard time falling asleep, if they're waking up quite frequently. I always say if a baby is waking up hourly or less than two hours, there's usually something else going on. It's their way of telling you that something's bugging them. So whether that's gas, discomfort, uh, food sensitivities, um, undiagnosed tongue ties, enlarged tonsils, adenoids, low ferritin. Um, these are all things, when I was talking about iron, it's the, it's the ferritin, so it's the iron stores that would be low that would impact sleep. These are all things just to keep in mind um, if you are really struggling with sleep, if your little one's up a lot, and if they seem uncomfortable. Okay, I thought this was a good one because I'm gonna tie in a couple together, but there was a question about, is there a biologically ideal bedtime for toddlers? And I'm gonna tie it in with a bed sharing question as well. Like, what do I think about bed sharing? What do I think about co-sleeping, etc.? Because I think one of the things that has certainly shifted in my sleep practice uh, as of late is really just starting to take more of an anthropological view to sleep and looking at sleep in different countries. So we have these rules around sleep um, that we will hear a lot. Oftentimes parents will be told the ideal bedtime for a baby is 6, 7, 8 p.m. Um, we'll be told that babies need to sleep in their cribs. That's where they're getting the best sleep. We'll be told that babies need to sleep for two hours for two two hour long naps and then maybe an hour in the afternoon. We'll be told that babies should be sleeping in their own crib, in their own room. Um, you know, we hear all these things around infant sleep, but what is really important and what I would always, what I always say to parents is that babies sleep differently around the world. And we don't have any research or any proof that any of these babies or any of these people are harmed in any way by different sleep practices. There are countries where babies go to sleep and toddlers go to sleep around midnight and they might take an afternoon siesta. Um, there are places where um, babies will, babies and children will sleep with their parents for, for an extended period of time, sometimes up to eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. Because the reality is, is that a lot of places in the world and a lot of parents in the world cannot afford a separate sleep space or a separate sleep service. Um, so bed sharing and co-sleeping have been a part of um, their practice um, for, for, for forever. Um, there are countries where babies spend every single 
minute strapped to their parents back um, you know they're napping in motion on their parents back on the go they are certainly not sleeping in a crib uh, in their own room and they are completely fine so when I hear questions about like what is a normal or a good or um, you know an ideal bedtime for a toddler there isn't one uh, because everybody is different, every family is different, and you need to find what works best for you and your family, um, and also understand that babies sleep differently. I know there are countries where babies sleep outside year round uh, in their pram or in their in their stroller. Uh, this is the norm. This is where all babies sleep. They do not sleep in a crib. You know, so we have all these interesting practices around the world of how babies sleep and we don't have any evidence to suggest that any of these practices impact um, their sleep, impact their development, somehow harm them. So it really just, I always want parents to know that you need to do what works for you. Um, you need to find what works best for your family and for your child um, and, then, and then continue to do that. This should be a short one. What are your thoughts on dream feeds? Uh, so I really believe, and part of my approach is that you need to do what works best for you. Um, and so a lot of parents will use a dream feed and they love a dream feed. It's not something that I typically use with families, uh, but one really great thing that I love about a dream feed is if you go to bed, let's say at 9.30 and you your little one always wakes up at 10, it's nice to be able to give a dream feed before you go to bed to see if you can get a little bit of a long or stretch in the beginning part of the night and give yourself just a little bit of extra sleep. So that's one instance where I oftentimes will use it and suggest it to families, but it's just not something I tend to use. Again, you need to do what works for you and what works for your family. Okay, so I had some questions about the Merlin suit and the swaddle and specifically how long do they stay in them and how do they come out of them? So you don't ever have to swaddle your baby. You don't. Um, and like the thing I think that we forget is that the swaddle does will kind of oftentimes lead to longer stretches of sleep for the first couple months, but eventually they have to come out of it. So either you're gonna get that really interrupted sleep in the beginning until your baby figures everything out, or you're going to get it when they need to come out of the swaddle. So it is no longer safe to keep your baby in the swaddle when they can roll. So one of the ways that parents will do it is sometimes they'll take one arm out at a time. So this can sometimes help to make the transition a little bit easier. Um, some parents will swaddle just from the waist down with some of those Velcro swaddles. Um, and it's still giving that proprioceptive input that baby was looking for being in the swaddle. Some parents will just do cold turkey uh, and just take the swaddle off and expect that uninterrupted or that, that really interrupted sleep. It really just depends on your baby's temperament and also on um, how much you can handle because it's definitely, it's certainly a challenging time for a lot of parents, but once they can roll, it's no longer safe to be in the swaddle. And the Merlin suit, um, I, it, it is serving as a nice transitional item for a lot of parents to move from the swaddle to the Merlin suit uh, because baby can stay in it a little bit longer. But again, just remember that they have to come out of it. So it is up to you and your um, and really your baby's temperament in terms of how you approach removing the swaddle or removing the Merlin. But sometimes we're just getting to a place where, you know, we're going from Swaddle to Merlin to other things um, and we're delaying kind of the inevitable, which is that eventually they are going to need to come out. So how you approach removing that is up to you. But it is important to remember that the Swaddle is no longer safe after that point when they can roll and they do need to come out. Okay, tips for the transition to one nap. So what can start to happen usually around nine, 10, 11 months is that babies are taking two long naps during the day or one really long nap and then they're not able to get the afternoon nap or the afternoon nap is getting later and later and pushing bedtime back later and later. It is important to know that there's no wrong bedtime. There's no bedtime that's too late. Um, it is really just what works for you and your family. But if it is getting too 
a point where that bedtime is getting later um, or you can't get that afternoon nap. What I usually recommend before moving to one nap is to cap the morning nap. So wake your little one up after an hour, after 45 minutes, after 40 minutes, after 30 minutes. And if you cap that nap and you can still get the afternoon nap, then there's no point in transitioning to one nap. You can continue to do two naps and oftentimes that works out for a lot of families. If you cap the nap and you still can't get the afternoon nap or the amount of time that afternoon nap is getting pushed back farther and further and bedtime is getting late for you, for your unique family, so it's not working for your family, then you can get ready to make that transition to one nap. Um, oftentimes, usually we will say, ideally that nap is happening closer to, that one nap's happening closer to 11.30, ideally 12, 12.30, 1, um, so that you can make it through to bedtime without having a really crabby, fussy baby. Um, so if you can, one thing that you can start to do is try to push that nap back a little bit later, a little bit later, a little bit later. Um, you may need to compensate for a couple days with an earlier bedtime. The other thing that you can do is even if you can't get the nap later, consider a rest time around 4, 4.30, maybe even in the carrier if you can, um, so that it's quiet. Um, and so that they're still resting even if they aren't sleeping um, and see if that might help you get through to bedtime. The other thing that's important to know is that some days the transition works and you got two naps or one nap, other days you have two naps and it is really important when you're going through any nap transition just to go with the flow uh, and accept that there's gonna be a lot of unpredictability as you're going through the transition um, and it will take some time. So hopefully that helps a bit. Okay, so this question I think will answer a lot of questions. I hope to kind of like summarize and condense it all in one, um, in one answer. But this was, is it okay to be co-sleeping with my two-year-old and when should this end? So here's the thing, we have all of these rules around infant sleep. A lot of them are very dated, are not based in any science or actually any fact. Um, and does not take into account what we know about babies and attachment needs. So we had this idea, I think, I feel like it was like the 60s, 70s, 80s, that we needed to have independent children. And how we, have, we, ha we made these independent children is to separate them from their parents as soon as possible. Now, it, this whole idea of independence is so ingrained um, that we don't even think twice about it. The reality is, is that what we know about independence is independence happens after years of being able to deeply depend. Um, it is not something that happens when we just use separation. Um, and that is a forced independence, that is not true independence. Um, so a lot of the things that we are afraid of, that we are letting our babies depend on us to fall asleep, to fall back asleep, to sleep close to us, come from this whole need to have these independent children um, and then using separation to get independence. If you want to sleep close to your baby or your toddler, if you want to nurse your toddler to sleep, if you want to rock them to sleep, if you want them to sleep in their own room, um, if you want them to sleep on a floor bed, uh, if you, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, do it. There, there is nothing wrong with, with supporting your child to sleep, with keeping them close, with um, letting them depend on you. Nothing wrong at all. Uh, when should it end? When it isn't working for you. What works for one family does not work for another. There is no one right answer for any family. Some families um, cannot bed share safely, do not feel comfortable co-sleeping, don't have the ability to have a crib in their room because the room isn't big enough. Um, some families, I always love the line by Professor James McKenna, is the very fact that we're in a position to ask um, where our baby should sleep and how means that we're in a position of privilege. A lot of places in the world cannot afford a separate sleep surface, cannot afford a separate sleep space. Um, so I think I just, if I can say one thing over and over and over again is that every family is unique. You can let your baby depend as much as possible. Um, you can snuggle them to sleep, you can nurse them to sleep, you can nurse them back to sleep, or you don't have to. Um, but the only person who has the answer as to when it's too long or when it's, you know, when it's not right is you because it's your unique family and you get to make those decisions. So hopefully that helps.
Okay, so I'm gonna answer this next one. I'm gonna try and do it quick. It's hard to do these, these uh, answer these questions in quick little snippets, but here we go. My toddler refuses to sleep in his bed and wakes up every night to come into our bed. How do I get him to sleep in his own bed after co-sleeping since birth? I'm done breastfeeding. Um, so I actually wasn't sure whether you meant co-sleeping, which is sleeping in the same room versus bed sharing, which is bed sharing is um, a version of co-sleeping, which is sleeping on the same sleep surface. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm assuming also that now you have um, your toddler in their own room, in their own bed. So one thing that's really important to do is make sure they love their sleep space. So tons of daytime play in their sleep space. Another thing that I always recommend to parents is making sure that we're adding lots of one-on-one -on -one distraction-free connection time, um, not only during the day. I know um, if we're working and our children are out of the home, it can be difficult, but finding some time to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one connection time or at least being able to make sure that we're giving that time to connect at night. The other thing that I usually talk to parents about is how we leave our children at night. So it, it, it is, um, we have this idea that toddlers should be okay because they're past a year or past two years with being okay, for, uh, with being okay from being away from us all night. Remember that toddlers, they're still little. Um, and so if we look at it from an attachment perspective, they're still not really able to handle these long periods of separation. And what nighttime represents um, what nighttime represents for a toddler, especially if they're sleeping away from us, is 12 hours of separation. So if you're struggling because your little one is constantly coming into your bed, it is important to start changing the language and how we're speaking to them about exactly what's going on at night. Instead of pushing things like separation, you know, you have to go to sleep and you need to stay in your own bed and you can't come into our bed and you can't come into our room. What we're really wanting to do is making sure that we're switching our language around. Um, and saying things like, if you need me, I will always come. All you have to do is call and I will be here. You know, if you really wanna come into our room, a lot of parents have set up a space on their floor to say, if you need to be close to me, if you need to be next to me, if you need to be in my room, come join me on the floor. I have a special space set up. You know, you're always welcome. If we say to a child, go to sleep, stay in your room, you're not gonna see me, this is where you need to stay, that's all they can think about. We want them to take that for granted. So using a different approach and saying, whenever you call, I will come, will just help to relieve some of that stress they might be feeling around bedtime. The other thing is making sure that we're bridging separation which is to say we're helping them hold on to us when they are apart from us. So you can do things like reading The Kissing Hand, which I know a lot of people know this book. Um, you can do things like tying an invisible string from your heart to their heart or your bed to their bed. Um, you can do things like um, even um, taking a picture of them when they sleep and showing them that you checked on them. You can say things like, I will see you in your dreams. And in doing that in the morning, you need to make sure that you said that you've seen them in their dreams. But what you're trying to do is help bridge that 12 hours of separation, which they are telling you is too much. Another really great thing or another great strategy to use is making sure that when we're leaving them at night, we're actually focusing on the next connection versus focusing on um, the separation. So you might set up an activity before bed and say, I'm really looking forward to doing this with you in the morning or setting up um, the table before bed for breakfast and talking about how you're really looking forward to breakfast in the morning. So some of these strategies used together and used for a period of time can really, really help to bridge that separation. So hopefully that helps. So the last question I wanted to cover quickly, which is not a quick answer, but, um, and I do want to be very careful um, on how we talk about it because it is an important conversation to be had but know that there is lots more information about this on my page is around bed sharing um, i do want to let you know that the american association of pediatrics has recommended room sharing for at least the first six months to a year i think are your recommendations um, not sleeping on the same sleep surface they have however said that they do understand that many parents in the middle of the night who are exhausted um, and trying not to bed share. So they're feeding in a um, recliner or feeding on a couch or in a rocker, um, may fall asleep because especially if you are a breastfeeding parent, that is what breastfeeding is designed to do. Make your baby fat sleepy and also you sleepy. So if there is any chance that you could fall asleep while feeding your baby, 
in one of those unsafe sleep situations, with a, which is a couch, a recliner, or a rocker, you are better off to set your space up for safe bed sharing. Um, and so if this is something that you're interested in or something that's happening for you, um, it, there are lots of resources online. Professor James McKenna is a wealth of knowledge on safe bed sharing. La Leche League also has the Safe Sleep 7 that they have put out um, around bed sharing. And there's also a book called Safe Infant Sleep, which is all about bed sharing and doing it safely. There are lots of resources online for you to access that information. So if you do make the decision to to bed share and if that's something that you choose to do or something that you're doing out of necessity because there is a chance that you might fall asleep while feeding your baby make sure that you go through these resources so that you understand how to do it safely um, and how to make your space um, safe to have your baby in the bed with you so hopefully that will help a little bit with bed sharing and if you're interested in more information on bed sharing feel free to pop over onto my page where i talk about it quite a bit